Yet it was in Korea in June 1950 that the next crisis came, on the other side of the world. Japan had lost Korea at the end of the war. The Americans accepted the Japanese surrender below the 38th parallel, the Russians above it. North Korea became communist, the South set up a kind of democracy. Each leader claimed the right to govern the whole peninsula. Tension erupted on June the 25th, 1950, when North Korean divisions crossed the 38th parallel into South Korea. The South Koreans appealed to the United Nations. Following an American proposal, the Security Council decided at once to help South Korea. The Russians were boycotting the Council at the time, otherwise they'd certainly have vetoed the plan. First American, then British troops were sent to Korea. They were later joined by troops from 14 other nations. By August the 1st, the North Koreans had pushed to the perimeter of Pusan, leaving the South only a toehold on the peninsula. In just five weeks, a whole population had become refugees. American bombing of the North Korean advance added to the civilian misery. The United Nations planned a counter-attack. On September the 15th, United States General Douglas MacArthur carried out a maneuver to cut off the enemy. Two US divisions landed at Incheon. Tides and weather made it risky, but it was a success. Within three days, the landing was established. Caught between Incheon and the United Nations attack from the south, the North Korean army melted away. MacArthur received orders to destroy the enemy in North Korea. Much of their equipment had been supplied by the Russians. The UN pressed northwards. MacArthur had orders not to cross the Yellow River into China, nor to use troops near the Russian border. Mao Zedong in China was concerned about the fate of communist North Korea and about the security of China. As MacArthur pressed on, 200,000 Chinese moved into North Korea. On November the 24th, the two sides met head on. Now MacArthur's advance became a retreat. US President Truman looked to the Security Council for a way out. If aggression is successful in Korea, we can expect it to spread throughout Asia and Europe and to this hemisphere. We have committed ourselves to the cause of a just and peaceful world order through the United Nations. There is, however, no indication that the representatives of Communist China are willing to engage in this process. <laughs> The Russian delegate demanded that the United Nations forces should withdraw. Among the British forces trying to halt the Chinese advance was Jack Hobbs. We found ourselves on the south bank of the River Imjin. We took up our positions on the hilltops around. There we waited and watched. As night drew on, we knew the Chinese were there. We could hear them. They were chattering, shouting to each other, probably to keep their courage up, probably fighting the same as we were. Then came a series of bugle calls, whistles. This was their method, and this continued right throughout the night. The next morning, the adjutant, who was exasperated by these bugle calls, said to me, have we got a bugle up here? I said, I think the drum major's got one, sir. He said, well, tell him to blow. I said, what shall he sound? 
He said anything except retreat. Then, on the Sunday night, they came. Masses of them. They must have had unlimited manpower. Eventually, after three days and nights of fighting, a quick check of the remaining ammunition revealed about three rounds per man. The colonel received permission from brigade to evacuate the hill. Later, the Americans said this stand by the Gloucesters was one of the greatest acts of bravery in modern warfare. MacArthur had disobeyed orders in pushing so far north. Truman decided he must go. It was of the deepest personal regret that I found myself compelled to take this action. General MacArthur is one of our greatest military commanders. But the cause of world peace is much more important than any individual. General Ridgway took over a desperate situation. United Nations troops drew up a final line of defense near Seoul and held it. With the battle line stalemated, the Russian delegate at the United Nations spoke. The Soviet people believe that as a first step, discussions should be started between the belligerents for a ceasefire and an armistice, providing for the mutual withdrawal of forces from the 38th parallel. In a tea house at Ki Song on July the 10th, 1951, ceasefire talks began. It took the talks of getting nowhere. They ended up They achieved nothing. During another year, the fight continued. In October 1952, a new American president was elected. Now, where the new election begins? It will begin with its president taking a firm, simple resolution. That resolution will be to forego the diversions of politics and to concentrate on the job of ending the Korean War. I shall go to Korea. In December 1952, he went. Eisenhower hinted afterwards that strong military action would have to be taken to end the stalemate. In America, there was talk of using nuclear weapons. In the Soviet Union, Stalin died. Truce talks began again at Panmunjom in April 1953. This time they actually made progress. But Syngman Rhee, president of South Korea, raised obstacles. Rhee wanted a South Korean army of 20 divisions trained by the Americans. He demanded reunification of South and North. The South Koreans lost many more troops before Rhee finally agreed to sign an armistice. At Panmunjom on July the 13th, 1953, an armistice was agreed based on a military truce line. That line continued to divide the two countries. Once again, the Soviet Union and America had avoided open conflict. The fighting and destruction were confined to one small peninsula. But at the cost of millions of lives, civilians as well as soldiers. Uh-uh. <laughs> 